It's uh, my great pleasure and a real honor this morning to introduce our keynote speaker for the day, uh, the General Counsel uh, and Senior Vice President of Microsoft, Brad Smith. I first met Brad right after the case settled, and we were going before Judge Kohler Catelli to try to begin the process of getting it approved. Uh, he stood up as the new face of Microsoft, the new courtroom face. Uh, and it really began what has been, I think, a very different approach and a very different tone by the company to antitrust issues and other compliance issues here and in Europe. One that's really focused on being constructive and positive and moving forward and trying to make the best of what is obviously a difficult uh, situation for the company. At Microsoft, Brad oversees not only antitrust uh, and compliance, but also intellectual property uh, and all of the other uh, fascinating policy and regulatory issues that a company like Microsoft finds itself in the middle of. It's obviously been uh, heavily, heavily involved in all of the dealings with the Europeans, and the other international enforcers, as well as the ongoing efforts with uh, the Justice Department and the states here in the United States. So we're very fortunate to have Brad with us today, and I ask that you welcome him warmly. Brad? All right, well, thank you, Phil. Thanks to all of you. Um, let me first second what Dave Heiner was saying and, and say it, we are really pleased to be included in this event this weekend. Um, it does give us the opportunity to relive those wonderful memories <laughs> of that trial. I, I will acknowledge that some people have spent the better part of 10 years trying to forget some of those days and some of those images that we saw again on the screen yesterday. Um, I mean, let's be honest, using the political discourse of the day, um, if you're from Microsoft, there's just no way to put any lipstick on that trial. <laughs> <laughs> Occasionally at Microsoft, people who are involved get together and they reminisce about their own sort of highlight reel from the trial, if you will, and 28 seconds later, they go back to work. <laughs> uh, it does remind me of the real story, a real story, uh, when the findings of fact were issued and the, the next day we had that document, all 414 paragraphs, and is often the case in this kind of situation, Someone very senior said to someone more junior, you know, take this and, and, and go highlight the paragraphs that are helpful for us so you know, we can talk about them. And so people went away and they came back and they said, well, we've highlighted one paragraph. <laughs> and the answer was, one paragraph? You're saying out of 414, you only found one paragraph to highlight? And, well, not quite. And, the more senior person said, well, well that's good. What, what are you saying then? Well, the answer was, we found one sentence in one paragraph. <laughs> well, I hope it's a good sentence. And the answer was, well, it depends. <laughs> it depends on what? Well, if you read the sentence by itself, it's good. <laughs> but if you read the sentence before it and you read the sentence after it and then put it in the middle, well, it's not so good. So we had a, a lot to address as time went by. Um, and in all seriousness, with Phil here, with so many of you here, you know, we, we had our days as adversaries. Um, you know, the people who work for the DOJ, for the states, the economists, the experts, you know, they were all people who we quickly came to respect. And as we've had the opportunity to work more and more over the years with some who have continued, you know, there have been people we've come to appreciate even more. It is interesting, I will say, because the trial was 10 years ago. And for some people here, you stopped working on this matter 10 years ago. And yet for others, it's a matter of ongoing daily life to this day. Because the Court of Appeals decision you know, it was seven years ago. Uh, the, entry, the, the entry of the judgment was six years ago. Uh, the Court of Appeals decision finally putting the Massachusetts appeal to rest was five years ago. And it was just literally eight months ago that the European Commission opened an investigation that, among other things, focused on whether it was appropriate to integrate the browser into the operating system. So the issues have come and gone and in some ways are still here in many different respects. 
you can't necessarily be quite as candid talking about something that ha is a part of ongoing daily life, but nonetheless, I will be as candid as I can as I try to look back from Microsoft's perspective about a trial that took place 10 years ago and that continues to have so many important effects today. If you think back to that trial, there's a lot of questions I could ask myself. You know, what were the mistakes we made? What were the lessons we learned? How did we change? And I think it's the third question that I'd like to focus on the most, because I think that's the real test. Lessons that are learned but not applied, that don't really lead to any change, are of some academic interest but little practical import. And I think the real question for us as we look back is, how did we change and why did we change as a result of this experience? And then more broadly, how did the industry change? And how did things even beyond our industry change, in part because of the events that took place in that core group? Certainly for us, it was clear that we needed to change. And it was clear from the top of the company that we needed to change. It was clear from the chairman, Bill Gates, and the CEO, Steve Ballmer, and it was clear to me when I was given the opportunity to start this job in 2002, that I not only was being given a job, but I was being given a mandate to drive change. And that was an important part of, in fact, my enthusiasm about moving forward. We did so with the strong support of the company's board of directors. It was certainly interesting that one of the things that Judge Catelli did in her decision in 2002, I think in part because of the issues that were, were being discussed in the business community in the wake of the Enron debacle, if you will, was to require that our board of directors create a special committee, an antitrust compliance committee that would be filled exclusively by independent directors. And so Dr. Jim Cash, then at the Harvard Business School, who's here with us today, you know, assumed the chairmanship of that committee, a position that he's held ever since. Yesterday, Ray Gilmartin, who's now at the Harvard Business School, who is part of that committee, uh, was here as well. And so we really focused on making a series of changes from the top of the company down. And as I look back after six or seven years, to me, the changes that we made really fall into three principal categories. The first is that you don't see us anymore saying, we don't have to do that because we're not a monopoly. We don't have to do that because we don't have a dominant position. Without even trying to debate with myself whether that was a successful or unsuccessful tactic in the trial, it was clear that the industry, the government, the world at large expected us to step forward and assume more responsibility without appearing to quibble, if you will, about whether that kind of responsibility was required by the law itself. When we got to Brussels and had our case before the European Commission, we simply conceded that we had a dominant position in the desktop operating system market. And while there sometimes have been debates around the fringes, you know, we've typically been prepared to sit down with the DOJ or the states when we're talking about the consent decree and say, look, we actually don't think that what you're suggesting is required by the consent decree, the final judgment. We don't think that this particular category of software is covered by this, but let's figure out what it makes sense to do nonetheless. And even this year, when we took a number of steps to license communications protocols for new products, we did it for a number of products that many people would say are certainly not a monopoly, perhaps don't even have a dominant position. Products that are becoming popular like SharePoint, an office communication server. But we said, let's just focus on what seems like the right thing to do given the kinds of expectations that people have of us. So we've really tried to put one set of 
possible debates, if you will, to the side and move forward to focus on what it makes sense to do. The second thing we really focused on in starting in, in 2002 was this approach of just sort of getting out and working it out. You know, getting out and frankly, more than anything else, taking the first step of just listening better to what other people had to say. And using that listening to try to understand what people wanted and build a more relationship-based approach to dealing with a number of these issues. It started with improving relationships with governments themselves. Even before we had Judge Catelli's final decision, I had started to fly around the country and go to Des Moines and go to New York and go to Sacramento and go to other places. And, and I think for us, an important day was the day that Judge Catelli's decision was issued. It was November 1st, 2002. And I remember that morning. We got together, as we always did, as I'm sure those of you in the government did, on a day when you knew a decision was going to come out and you, know, you had all your PR scenarios. Here's the scenario if we win, here's the scenario if we lose, here's the scenario if it sort of comes out in between so that we were all ready. I was there with Bill Gates and, and Steve Ballmer and Dave Heiner and Mark Murray and others, and Steve turned to me and he said, you know, this isn't going to come out for another six or seven hours. Why don't you give Tom Miller a call and tell him that regardless of whether we win or whether we lose, we're going to want to work with him tomorrow. And I did. And I called Bill Lockyer. And then after the decision came out, even though we had won, we got on the road again. I'll always remember in January of 2003, trooping through the snow in Des Moines with Steve Ballmer as we went to see Tom Miller in his office. And you know, I think people thought, what are you doing? People only come here in January if you're running for president. <laughs> but it was a great thing to do. And Steve said to General Miller, look, I can't promise that we'll never have a disagreement. But I can promise you that as long as I'm the CEO, it won't be a disagreement that results from the lack of communication. And then I got on a plane with Bill, and we went down to California, and, and were able to have that same conversation with Bill Lockyer. And that has been a touchstone of the approach that we have tried to take ever since. It's not realistic to assume that communication and conversation will eliminate every disagreement. But they can solve a lot of them, and you never want to have a disagreement simply because of poor communication. By 2003, it was clear that this was something that we needed to do not only with people in government, but with others in our industry. If you look at the list and if you look at the products, and as you know, behind every product there was a company. Yeah. At that time, behind the browser, there was AOL Time Warner. And so in 2003, you know, I had the chance to start talking with Paul Cappuccio, who is, is and was the general counsel at Time Warner. And at first, we just sort of debated what had happened. And as Paul has mentioned, mostly I listened to what he had to say. And we said, well, let's see if we can start to get people together. Maybe there's something that we can do here to address the concerns that you all still have. And we did. And it was you know, a big step for us that by Memorial Day 2003, we were able to settle the private lawsuit that AOL had Time, Time Warner had brought against us, sort of the vestiges of the browser wars. And then we had the chance to ta start talking to Sun really about all of the Java issues. And if there was a lack of trust between Microsoft and AOL Time Warner, I think it's probably fair to say there was even a bigger lack of trust between Microsoft and Sun. And actually, one of the things that we learned from that experience was that sometimes it is your differences that divide you, but sometimes it's also your similarities that separate you. You know, we were both companies that were heavily driven by an engineering culture. Most of the companies in our industry are. It's one of their great sources of strength. But fundamentally, what engineers like to do most is sit down and invent things. 
flying around and talking to people and you know, really admiring what the other person is doing rather than praising what they've done themselves is not necessarily part of an engineering culture in virtually any engineering-based company. And part of the problem that we had between Microsoft and Sun was not just that we saw some things differently, but in other respects, we were too much alike. Neither of us had spent enough time talking with each other. And so we had the chance to start to move that forward so that finally by the beginning of April 2004, we were able to resolve all of those issues. And then by 2005, we were able to do the same thing with real networks and put to rest their issues relating to the media player. It hasn't always worked. We spent an unbelievable amount of time in the first few months of 2004 trying to reach an agreement with the European Commission. And it was only when we actually thought we had that, in fact, we found that the agreement had slipped through our grasp, if you will, and instead we headed off to court in Europe. But by and large, I think you could ask any of us at Microsoft, and we would say that we feel that we're far better off, and it's far more responsible for us as a company to basically spend as much time as we do on the road with people in government and with people in our industry trying to find common ground wherever possible and trying to solve, in many cases, small problems before they become much larger. So this focus on getting out and, and working it out really did became, become that second part of what we sought to do. The third conclusion we ultimately came to was one that we started to apply externally in 2006. But it was actually one that a number of us inside the company had been discussing for a significant period of time. The basic premise or the, that we started to come to was that in the world as it exists today, it's really not enough for a company to just tell others what it's doing. You have to explain why. You have to explain why so people can have the ability to predict what you're going to do next, especially if they rely on you. And so what we came to was a view that said, you know, what we have to do is actually put together some principles that we're prepared to put down on paper and publish and stand behind that will tell people that as far as we can see into the future, and absent any changes which we would announce in advance, this is what you can expect us to do. So as Dave mentioned, in July of 2006, we published the Windows Principles. In a lot of ways, they did two things. First, they said, even if this judgment expires, we are still going to operate our business in accordance with these principles, many or most of which really are derived from the judgment itself. And we're going to apply them not only to the categories that are spelled out in the judgment, but we'll apply them to some other important areas as well. And beyond that, we recognize that the world is continuing to change, so we'll add to our principles some tenets that are not in the final judgment, but that people are asking us about today, so that you can see and you can test us by whether we live up to these words. And generally, I think that was a very positive thing for us to have done. We learned more from doing that. And so we followed it in other instances. We actually applied it in the non-antitrust arena in 2007, last year, when we issued privacy principles. And then earlier this year, we issued a set of interoperability principles, principles that originate in part from the antitrust experiences that we've had, but go far beyond it and really reflect not only what the law and governments have been pushing us to do, but where the market and where technology is going as well. And I think one of the great things about this experience is that it forces us and it helps us inside the company to get everybody together and ask ourselves, what are the things that we are prepared to say we will do, knowing in advance that we are going to do them? 
Before we finished the interoperability principles, Steve Ballmer said he wanted to have a meeting, and we did. He said, I want all of the engineering vice presidents in the company to get together. We've been working on this for two months. Everybody's seen it. Everybody has, has had input into it. Now I want to know two things. Does anybody have any last minute objection so I can hear it before I decide? And does everybody understand that once this goes out the door, this is how we're running our business? So the principles have served an important role inside the company to help foster decision making as well as externally in enabling us, I think, to work more collaboratively with others in the industry. So when you add up this you know, focus on stepping forward, getting out, and taking a more principled approach, it has, I think, enabled us to do business in a different way. Like all things, it has its warts, it has its imperfections, it has its downsides, but on balance, it's an approach that we feel has served us well and served the industry well, and an approach that we're certainly very committed to pursuing as we continue to move forward. At the same time that we've been changing, the industry has been changing. You know, 10 years later, it's a very different industry. That shouldn't be a surprise. What would be a surprise is if 10 years later, the industry were exactly the same. When you look at how dynamic everything is, it would be simply almost bizarre for everything to have remained the same. But it is interesting to look at some of the changes in our industry, especially in the context of the discussion that we're having here in this last panel discussion, which I thought highlighted a number of these things. The reality, of course, is that the industry has changed for lots of reasons. It's changed because of advances in technology. It has changed because of market economics. And it has changed because of the remedy in the antitrust case. And what is probably most interesting is, is that a lot of these changes have reinforced each other. I mean, one can have the debate which change was most important. It's an interesting debate, but ultimately the question is an imponderable. No one can know. And at one level, it probably doesn't even matter. I personally think that a well-designed government intervention, whether it's in an antitrust context or any other, is probably an intervention that reinforces the trends of a healthy market rather than fights against them. But it is interesting, I think, now to look back and highlight a few of those changes that are most significant. First, I think, much as Ed started to, to point us towards, the changes in technology, the, the changes in the internet, are probably changes that are bigger than anything else. I mean, Bill Gates wrote his memo in 1995 and called it the internet tidal wave, and it has been a tidal wave. It would be very difficult for anything, certainly almost impossible for anything from any single company or any single government to be as strong as the internet tidal wave has been. Now, when you think about the issues in the lawsuit 10 years ago, one of the concerns that the government had was that the OEM channel, the PC manufacturing channel, was a primary, perhaps the primary, vehicle for competitors to use to distribute their software and get them out to consumers. And indeed, it, it, it was a very important channel of distribution. It is less important today than it was 10 years ago, precisely because ubiquitous internet access and increasing broadband distribution have made it so easy to get new software onto consumers' machines simply by offering them for downloading over the internet. And when you look at the ubiquity, not just of applications that people talk about, like Facebook, but the software tools that people use, whether it's Java or Flash or others, you know, internet distribution has just profoundly changed the equation. It's also the case, as, as Ed was pointing to, that more and more people are writing their applications for the web, which means they can be run on any operating system on any computer. It's interesting as we sit here today, 
A number of you have laptops. If you have a laptop in front of you, raise your hand. If your laptop is not running Windows, raise your hand. It was 10 years ago that Jim Barksdale asked those questions in the hearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee. And everybody raised their hand in response to the first, and no one raised their hand in response to the second. In part, the ubiquity of the web, the nature of the internet has transformed computing in so many ways that the role of the operating system is in a somewhat different place today. But a second change that has been unfolding over the last 10 years, one that hasn't been talked about so far in the last day and a half, is also important, I think. And that's the changes in the nature of the PC market. When the trial took place in 1998, there were hundreds of companies selling significant numbers of PCs in the United States and thousands of companies doing so around the world. Now, by and large, the PC market has consolidated. You know, two companies by themselves account for over half of all of the PCs sold in the United States. By the time you get to sort of company number seven or eight, you've covered about 80% of the PC market. What does that mean in this context? Well, it means the following. 10 years ago, people were concerned, including people in government, that the suppliers of critical components for PCs, whether it was the operating system or something else, had a superior negotiating position when they sat down with a PC manufacturer. If that was the case when Microsoft was negotiating with hundreds of OEMs, it's quite a different dynamic today when a company like Microsoft is negotiating with a much, much smaller number, and each of them has such a large market share. So that's the second thing that, that really has been uh, a significant change in the industry. A third change that I would point to is the remedy in this case. The remedy has had an impact. I don't know whether it's the most important or how to gauge it, but it has clearly had an impact. And think for a moment, if you will, about the slide that Jonathan Zittrain showed us yesterday, the notion that in part what this case was about was ensuring that Microsoft wouldn't control all of the aspects of the desktop on a new PC, that it would remain open, that PC manufacturers would be able to install and promote, even promote exclusively, other categories of software. The consent decree that was put in place had many provisions, all reinforcing each other, that ensured, among other things, that that remained the case. And indeed, PC manufacturers have been quite enthusiastic about installing other software on new machines. So much so, as Dave alluded to earlier, that it actually raises some interesting issues for consumers. But the market, I think, will have the opportunity to work through that the way the market works through lots of other things as well. One of the interesting things about the remedy was that it wasn't designed to address only the issues with respect to the browser. You know, it identified four other areas of so-called middleware as well. Messaging software, media player, email, the Java virtual machine. In each of these categories, Microsoft has invested, Microsoft has done well, and so have lots of others. AOL remains the market leader for messaging software in the United States. While Windows Media Player is very broadly distributed, Flash from Adobe is actually the most ubiquitous media player found on the planet. And since a lot of what people care about when they talk about media players is really not even the media player, it's digital media, the reality is that Apple, more than any other company, has really established the leadership position in that space. So if the one goal of the remedy was, as I think it clearly was, to ensure that there would be 
you know, clear rules and vibrant competition in all of these areas, one can look back a decade later and see that vibrant competition is alive and well. And indeed, even in the browsing space, I don't think that Navigator from Netscape ever really died. It just transformed itself into a new product with a new name called Firefox that is gaining market share. And it's certainly interesting that a decade later, there's a new entrant into that area with Google launching its own browser. And indeed, I think one of the interesting things about the remedy is that while it was confined to five specific areas, the implementation of it, the enforcement of it, has not been confined only to those five. People in government have raised with us issues and questions and at times concerns about other categories. The most notable, perhaps, over the last couple of years being desktop search. And even though it's nowhere mentioned in the remedy, we did sit down, and as Steve Houck said yesterday, we did make changes in order to address the concerns that people were raising. I do think that some of that reflects something which some people have remarked upon from time to time, and which I think has at least a certain dose of validity. To some degree, the trial itself was part of the remedy. It was a powerful experience to have to go through, not just for Microsoft, but for every company in the country that also watched what Microsoft experienced. It certainly is a sobering reminder, I think, of the importance of solving small problems before they get bigger. Every once in a while, we have a new executive who joins Microsoft and person has a bright idea and they want to go do something and somebody says, yeah, but oh my gosh, you know, this is going to you know, anger a large part of the industry. There could be real questions about whether this is an appropriate thing to do. And the person says, oh, come on, the company I was at, this is no big deal. We can go do that. Let's just go fight. And Steve Ballmer sort of says, you weren't here when we had that trial, were you? <laughs> you have to appreciate how the world thinks about and expects us to act. So it does have an effect to this day. And with all such things, there are days when one might feel that the effect is positive and days when one might feel that the effect is less so. But I think it, it, it would not be, be credible, it would certainly would not be candid to stand here and, and deny that it doesn't continue to have an effect. So the industry, in my view, you know, has changed, and it has changed for reasons that are unrelated to the case, and, change it, and it has changed for reasons that are, but the reality is a lot of these changes have reinforced each other, and it has created a very different dynamic a decade later. Finally, to me, some of the most interesting aspects of the trial, looking back after 10 years, really are not related to antitrust law, they're not related to software or information technology. They are in part a reflection of how the world has changed. The trial itself was in part a reflection of certain aspects of a changing world, and the trial in part contributed to a changing of the world. Certainly we all live in a world today with far greater transparency than existed 15 years ago. We live in a world today where a higher percentage than ever of what people say and do is recorded in some form. Maybe it's an instant message. Maybe it's a photo on a Facebook page. Maybe it's a search history in Google, or maybe it's something else. The world started to see more of that transparency in that trial. And if you look at every legal case that has ensued since, every case has had more transparency, quite possibly, than the cases before. In a lot of ways, I think it really calls upon people to just recognize, certainly if they are in any position of responsibility in any institution of importance, that they do live a public life and they will be scrutinized in accordance 
with the expectations that people have of them. And so if you're going to choose that life, you should choose to live it well. Because if you don't, there will come a day when you will regret it. That is a difference, I think, about our society compared to 15 or 20 years ago. A second aspect of the trial that I have always found in some ways particularly fascinating was the role of the media. And if you think about the, this trial in 1998, it was unfolding at a time when me, the pace of media coverage was accelerating and the media itself was fragmenting. And we saw both of those phenomena play themselves out and in many ways, both of them have continued and have even gained more momentum in the years since. We'll all remember, I think, the immediate news coverage that was resulting, in part because cable news channels had airtime for the middle of the day, and in part because internet news services wanted to push out news immediately. So one no longer had the simple luxury, if you can think of it as even a luxury, of waiting until the end of the day to have a longer conversation with journalists before they published what they were seeing. We all had to move faster. The other thing that was interesting was the fragmentation of the media that was starting to unfold. It wasn't just the principal daily newspapers. It wasn't just the principal traditional network news channels. There were the cable channels. There were the CNETs. The, the new internet news sites that were springing up. And of course, a decade later, the media has fragmented so much more than was the case then that that, too, has had quite a substantial effect. Certainly for us, we learned some very important lessons. I think in part we learned that if you want to make your case in a court of law, you better figure out how to make it in a court of public opinion at the same time. If you actually look at a lot of the high profile cases of this decade, they never get to a court of law. If a company cannot make its case in the court of public opinion, it gets the message quickly and it basically folds up its tent. And so I think that in addition to living your life as a public life, you have to get out and be accessible and engage and share more information about what you're doing and why so that it, people at least have that as context when they're evaluating what they think about you. And the last thing that I think has really changed in the world, certainly something that in some respects we've been at the forefront of, of experiencing, is the enormous forces of globalization including the globalization of legal and regulatory proceedings. The IBM case in the 70s and 80s was handled by the DOJ, and it was handled by the European Commission. And so in a sense, that was a step towards the internationalization of antitrust issues. But the Microsoft case really went a lot farther as it became a global matter of regulatory review. At its height, we had cases in over 20 countries around the world. Some of them were public, some of them were not. And indeed, as we look back a decade later, that process is still not over. And this is an issue that I think the world is going to have to grapple with. One can have differing views about what government should get involved and why and how, but it is clearly, no matter what your point of view, a real challenge when government after government wants to take up the same issue. It certainly leads to a very lengthy proceeding and requires a large investment of resources that would otherwise be devoted to engineering or marketing or something else. It certainly leads to potential inconsistency as companies are then asked to do different things in different places. What is most challenging, in my view, is when governments start to do something that conflict with each other, and especially when multiple governments 
seek to regulate the world. I've been struck at times sitting with government officials in various parts of the world, and sometimes they say, this is not only what we want you to do for our jurisdiction, this is what we want you to do in the world. I said, well, you know, we had this case in the United States, and the U.S. government and the U.S. courts decided what they wanted us to do in the United States. And the answer is, I don't care. That was then. This is now. You answer to me when you're in my office. I said, well, that's good, but tomorrow I'm going to be in somebody else's office. Who am I supposed to answer to then? This is an issue not only for antitrust, it's an issue for virtually every important field of the law. And it's just so clear that as the years and decades progress, the world, and people in government in particular, will need to find new and better ways to manage these kinds of issues that so clearly cross borders. So when it comes to this greater transparency and broader media focus and, and globalization, the world as a whole is quite a bit different from a decade ago. And in some respects, the experience a decade ago provided us a glimpse of where things were going. And in some ways, it maybe wasn't even all bad for us to get that glimpse and have the opportunity to learn some of those lessons when we did. You know, in, in conclusion, I think we can all look back at the trial. And everybody, naturally, inevitably, will look at it from their own perspective. Everybody went through it from a slightly different position, from a slightly or sometimes more than slightly different point of view. And for each person, you can look back and you can say, you know, the trial meant many things. When I look back at it from Microsoft's perspective, it did mean many things. But I also think when I try to prioritize it in my own mind, it meant one thing more than any other. It was, an, it was a part of the maturing of Microsoft. I will always remember a conversation I had in Redmond with one of our senior executives when the trial was starting. And he said, you know, I don't understand why the government is suing us. We're just this little company in this remote corner of the country. You realize that perception takes time to catch up with reality. And in the same way, self-perception or self-awareness takes time to catch up with reality. In 1998, people at Microsoft still thought of themselves as working at a little company in a remote corner of the country. But the world was no longer looking at or thinking about Microsoft in that way. We were an important company, creating an important product that was affecting the rest of the industry and touching the lives of consumers around the world. Part of our maturation really required that we start to see ourselves the way other people had already begun to see us. It was not necessarily an easy thing to do. I think it seldom is when you have to go through that kind of process. It has made us more mature. Even when you're more mature, you're not perfect. And we certainly are not a decade later. But I do think that we are 10 years older. I'd like to think we're at least 10 years wiser as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Why don't we take a few minutes for questions while we have Brad? This is a pretty prosaic question after that uh, pretty inspiring speech. But um, another thing that hasn't happened uh, much in the last 10 years is the, uh, the stock price hasn't done squat. <laughs> and uh, maybe, it's, maybe, it's just, maybe it's just coincidence. But 
I wound up wondering if internally at Microsoft, uh, the aftermath of the trial both made it a more bureaucratic and sluggish place because so much has to be run through lawyers and you have to think about the stuff that you used to not have to think about. And secondly, when you talk about change, I mean, when you get, I mean, do you think the trial actually changed the business model of the company since so much of it was, was built around as, um, the government folks like to say, leveraging Windows to the max. Um, and now you seem to be saying, and it seems pretty true to any observer, that doesn't happen anymore. And um, Microsoft has to make its way with new products with a slight advantage instead of a huge advantage. Great points, Joe. And I, I'd sort of distill it down into three questions. The first one is, has the company's business or business model or business practices changed? And at times the answer is, is yes. Yeah, we definitely know when new issues arise that there are, are certain options that are simply not possible to contemplate because they would not be permitted under the rules of the remedy. It's also the case, as Dave was pointing out earlier, you know, that there are times when we sit around and you know, we sort of sweat bullets about this rule of reason test for time. Um, yeah, we, we sweated a lot of bullets of, over antivirus protection. You know, we, we really thought, gee, you know, if we add antivirus protection to Windows, there's going to be clear benefits to consumers because the reality is a great many consumers let the antivirus protection that comes with their PC expire when the trial period runs out. So we have all these PCs that are unprotected. So we, we've got this great consumer benefit argument under the rule of reason test. And we also know that there are a number of antivirus companies that are making a couple of billion dollars a year from subscriptions that consumers are paying who are going to argue that there is great competitive harm. And you know, it's a little bit like you know, comparing apples and oranges. As, as, as Dave and I often remark, you know, if you've got six apples and no oranges, it's easy to know how to, to answer the question. But, you know, if, if you have about the same number in each hand, it sort of comes down to, well, do you prefer apples or do you prefer oranges? So, you know, there are times when, you know, clearly uh, we've had to think in different ways as, you know, we've been dealing with new opportunities or new challenges. And, yeah, you know, I, I think that is a fair thing uh, to point out. The second question that I think you're, you're, you raised is, in effect, has it made us more bureaucratic? That, too, is something that you know, we worry a lot about. You know, one of the things that we sort of concluded when we look back at IBM's experience from their antitrust experience um, was that you know, a lot of people who had been at, at IBM said, oh, you know, it made them a lot more bureaucratic. Some level of institutional organization is required to have an effective compliance regime, and yet we've also tried to design it in a way so as to minimize the bureaucracy, especially for engineering decisions. You know, so we have you know, quite a complex you know, compliance machinery, if you will. Part of it is prescribed by the remedy, it all ultimately folds up and reports to the board of directors. Um, we've got online training and people who work in a compliance group. Um, certainly in the area of technical documentation, something that became part of the remedy that wasn't part of the liability trial at all, you know, the, the fact is we've had hundreds of people working on, on creating documents. We have at the same time tried to remain as nimble as possible, especially when it comes to engineering creativity. And, and, and that is one thing we have, I think, reasonably found a way to do, because ultimately, you know, decisions can be made at the senior levels as to whether a new feature is incorporated in a product and how. So you can let the engineers go dream up great ideas and then try to build a step into the decision-making process that you know, really looks uh, at you know, that with a small number of senior people, hopefully in a nimble way. And I think we've done a reasonably good job uh, of that. Um, the third question you asked is, is basically, you know, well, for, you know, in, in 10 years, your, your stock price hasn't moved. Actually, for, you know, three years it moved, and then in one year it moved down, and then, you know, for six years it, it's been remarkably stable, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, um, 
And that actually, that part actually was a joke. Okay, so right. you don't have to but, answer. All right. <laughs> but I will say, in, you know, in all seriousness, the company has grown. You know, when Steve Ballmer became the CEO, it was a twenty billion dollar company in revenue. Now it's a sixty billion dollar company. It was generating eight billion dollars in profits. Now it's generating twenty, and we hope that people who buy stocks will take note of that growth. So it, I, I do think that you know, we've grown, the industry's grown, and you know, it, it, it's harder to get investors excited than it used to be. I was uh, particularly interested in some of your comments about uh, the PR aspects and winning in the court of public opinion. One of the things that I've been following uh, closely is what goes on in the public opinion concerning music file downloads where I think that in the late 90s, about 10 years ago, when Napster first came out, most people that you spoke to saw the technological development as a positive thing and didn't really have much of a problem with downloading music files. And over the 10 years that have been there, unfortunately, with the technology charge led by Napster and Grokster, who were, let's say, less than perfect corporate citizens, um, you've seen a complete flip in public opinion to the extent that very few people seem concerned when a third of the Supreme Court seemed ready to shut down an area of technology uh, because of concerns over copyrights. And I was wondering whether you'd felt that uh, the European investigation into Windows Media Player had hamstrung Microsoft from participating in, in some of those debates because uh, the technologists are getting their clocks cleaned. I don't feel that the European case has, you know, restricted our ability to invest, by and large, you know, in new technologies for digital media. Um, you know, and we have made investments, and sometimes they've been more successful, and sometimes they've been less successful, which you know, is probably true for any diversified uh, technology company. Um, I do think that the question you're asking raises a number of interesting broader points. Um, to me, I thought it was, in a way, a watershed moment when you saw stories about Napster and Grokster showing up in Time and Newsweek and you know, the very mainstream press. Fifteen years ago when I joined Microsoft, or twenty years ago when I started working as an outside lawyer with the company, you know, being an intellectual property lawyer was a little bit like being an anesthesiologist. You know, people thought, well, you know, it's, it, it, we like it, but no one else really you know, talks about us on a day-to-day -day basis. And you know, what has, has really happened over the last you know, two decades, and the last decade in particular, is the ubiquity and importance of technology has thrust a lot of these technology policy issues into the center of debate. And that makes perfect sense. It's not the first time in the nation's history that that has happened. In the 1870s and 1880s, one of the biggest political issues in the country was patent reform, as farmers in the Middle West were, were up in arms protesting against the patent laws. So I, th I think you know, technology goes through these waves over time, and, and when it does, it, it can start to take center stage in the broader public eye. I actually think that in in many respects and for the most part, it's really good for us to have these broader public discussions because these issues do affect people. And as, as you point out, the, sometimes the short-term impact looks one way, but the longer-term impact looks another way. And you know, I just think that that's why it's so important for people who work in this sector and many others to just get out and you know, spend more time making themselves available, articulating their views, and answering questions from people who are trying to synthesize all of this and, and provide some digest for the mass media. You talked about how the, the remedy has affected Microsoft and how the trial was such a sobering, uh, had such a sobering impact. I wonder if you could comment on the damages that were paid uh, both to the private uh, plaintiffs and to the European Commission and the extent to which that has had an effect on your thinking. The, it has been a source of frustration, to be honest, um, you know, in, in part because the nature of the class action system in this country um, 
you know, really works against, in my opinion, a single company who's a defendant when you have many cases in many states. Because if we win on an issue, it will not have collateral estoppel against a different class in a different state. But if we lose on an issue, it may, or you might even say it will. And you know, that fact, plus several others, really stacks the deck in a lot of ways against companies uh, you know, in, in managing this kind of litigation. And in my opinion, it is a factor in driving up you know, the settlements that are paid. And you know, my real point here is not the collateral estoppel effects of the issues in the DOJ case. It's not that at all. It basically meant that as the class action lawyers brought new issues to the table that went beyond it, you know, there's a risk reward equation that is very asymmetrical that I think is just a factor for businesses handling litigation in general. So you know, that, that has been a, a, a source of, of frustration. Um, you know, the European Commission's fines have been rather large, even unprecedented in many respects, you know, and at times, in our view, out of proportion to some of the issues that were being addressed. But um, you know, I understand and respect antitrust enforcers who want to ensure um, that large fines have a deterrent impact. I think that that is really what your question is. When you think about things, what affects you most? And money matters. You can't deny it. Reputation matters. I think in the world today, you might say that one's reputation is even more the coin of the realm. And I think companies have to and should take that very seriously. And ultimately, the new precedents that are created may matter the most. Now, I look back at you know, the remedies in this case, and you know, there are remedies that relate to one's ability to do something by contract with someone else. And there are remedies that relate to the, you know, the change of the technology by oneself. And you know, I think that the Court of Appeals decision and the remedy that ensued was more focused on con contractual restrictions that might be created with others, ultimately, than it was on engineering, although there are, as Dave was pointing out, clear rules with respect to engineering as well. But if one cares about innovation in the economy, I think that's a smart approach for the government to take. And when you're thinking about what might come next, you know, if you're a company that lives or dies on your ability to innovate, you know, anything that might touch innovation alone rather than an agreement with another company is just pretty much in a category all by itself. As much as I hate to do it, I think we better cut things off there or we'll get very far behind. Um, please join me in a huge thank you to Brad Smith. Thank you.